And the Force is what gives the Jedi his power. It's an energy field created by all living things. It surrounds us and penetrates us. It binds the galaxy together. Help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi. You're my only hope. What's this? What is what? He asked you a question. What is that? Help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi. You're my only hope. I stumbled across a recording while I was cleaning him. He says he belongs to someone called Obi-Wan Kenobi. I thought he might have met old Ben. Do you know what he's talking about? Tell me, young Luke, what brings you out this far? I have placed information vital to the survival of the Rebellion into the memory systems of this R2 unit. My father will know how to retrieve it. What have you done with those planets? Commander, tear this ship apart until you found those plans and bring me the passengers. I want them alive! I need your help, Luke. She needs your help. I'm getting too old for this sort of thing. Moss Eisley Spaceport. You will never find the more wretched hive of scum and villainy. We must be cautious. Han Solo. I'm captain of the Millennium Falk. Chewie here tells me you're looking for passage to the Alderaan system. What's the cargo? Only passengers. Myself, the boy, two droids, and no questions asked. Rebel Alliance is too well equipped. They're more dangerous than you realize. If the rebels have obtained a complete technical readout of the station, it is possible, however unlikely, that they might find a weakness and exploit it. The plans you refer to will soon be back in our hands. Stop that ship! Blast them! This station is now the ultimate power in the universe. I suggest we use it. We've had a great disturbance in the Force, as if millions of voices suddenly cried out in terror and were suddenly silenced. It's followed us! No, it's a short range fighter. Look at him, he's heading for that small moon. That's no moon. It's a space station. I have a very bad feeling about this. We captured a freighter entering the remains of the Alderaan system. We must be trying to return the stolen plans to the princess. Too short for a stormtrooper? Oh, the uniform. I'm Luke Skywalker. I'm here to rescue you. Whoa! We're gonna have company! <laughs> Can't win, uh. This will be a day long remembered. You will soon see the end of the rebellion. On May 25th, 1977, one of the most important movies in film history arrived, Star Wars. Produced on a small budget of $11 million, it proved a worldwide smash, earning over $750 million, making it the most successful film ever at the time. Critics praised it highly and the general public went crazy for it. The film arrived at a point in cinema that was dominated by gritty thrillers and end of the world sci-fi movies, so Star Wars was a breath of fresh air. The thrill of going to the cinema was back and in a big way. When it came time for the Oscars, it received 10 Academy Award nominations, including Best Picture, taking home seven awards for its production and costume design, visual effects, sound and film editing, soundtrack, and an extra special achievement award for its sound design. Director George Lucas was ahead of the curve and understood licensing was becoming an important part of a movie's release. He wanted full control of the licensing for Star Wars, and 20th Century Fox weren't too fussed to give it away, expecting it to have only a small market share. The license for Star Wars action figures were offered to many toy manufacturers, but all turned it down not seeing the potential in the license, but one company, Kenner, agreed to make a small range of toys. 
Although the original Star Wars film was released in May 1977, Kenner was not prepared for the unprecedented response to the film and the high demand for the toys. Kids went crazy for the merchandise and it became a nightmare for parents to track down the toys. Kenner was unable to produce sufficient stock in time for the lucrative Christmas market, so instead they sold an early bird certificate package, which included a certificate that could be mailed to Kenner and redeemed for four Star Wars action figures. The box also contained a diorama display stand, some stickers and a Star Wars fan club membership card. By the time the action figures were offered for direct sale in shops, the range had been increased with a further eight figures. They were supplemented later in 1978 with a number of vehicle and playset accessories. The toys today, if in good condition and boxed, can reach high prices and many sell for thousands of dollars. Before the advent of VHS, films were often re-released at the cinema a year or two after their initial release. And in 1981, Star Wars was shown again, but the prints came with a new subtitle, Episode 4, A New Hope. This was to fit within Lucas's trilogy and set in place the option to provide the prequels, which at this point was just a pipe dream. In 1993, they released the Star Wars Definitive Collection on Laserdisc, remastered under the THX program. These new transfers would be used for the 1995 VHS Last Chance to Own campaign. It would be the last opportunity to own the original trilogy before they received a special edition upgrade in 1997. Many of us younger fans never got to see Star Wars on the big screen, and the 97 re-release of the trilogy was a big deal. It was a huge success, with the cleanup of the optical effects, picture and sound, but came under criticism for the inclusion of new footage, mostly consisting of CGI, to expand upon certain locations and the redo of some important scenes. Star Wars fell victim to the largest amount of upgrades. The deleted scene of Jabba the Hutt was put back in, despite originally being cast as a human and later changed to a giant slug. They just added a CGI counterpart to cover up the original actor. The effect looked pretty bad for the time, but was later improved upon come the 2004 DVD release. They also buggered up the colour of Luke's lightsaber, with it looking green instead of blue. Isn't there any quality control on the releases? THX certified my ass. Mos Eisley was expanded to look busier, and the Attack on the Death Star was given a new lease of life to improve the dogfights. George Lucas was still not happy with the cut and made tiny adjustments come the Blu-ray release, like the addition of a rock in front of R2-D2. Yeah, that really improved the film. George Lucas originally came up with the idea of Star Wars during the making of his 1973 hit, American Graffiti. Lucas was a big fan of the classic action serials, such as Flash Gordon, and even attempted to gain the rights to produce a movie during the 70s, but failed to secure the option. So he decided he would pursue his own space opera, in a similar vein to the Flash Gordon he grew up on. Lucas began researching the science fiction genre by watching films and reading books and comics, drawing upon many ideas from mythology to form the basis of his story and the magical power of the Force. From 1973 to 76, the script took on many changes from characters' names to their appearances. Luke Skywalker's original surname was Star Killer, and he was a 60-year-old man. Han Solo was a large green-skinned monster with gills. The script was getting too big, totaling over 200 pages, and it had to be simplified to make a clear story. During this process, it became more of a fairy tale quest, as opposed to the action adventure that was originally envisioned. A lot of what was cut out George had hoped to include in the sequels, but he just needed to focus on getting this movie made first. George Lucas shopped the script around to a couple of studios, and they showed no interest, but this relieved Lucas because he still enjoyed his independent status, and wanted to have full control of his movie and its intended sequels. Lucas presented his Star Wars to Alan Ladd Jr., the new studio chief at 20th Century Fox. Alan Ladd had worked as a producer and knew George Lucas had talent, thanks to American Graffiti. He was keen to invest in Lucas despite Ladd having no clue about the tech side of the film. Lucas worked with his wife Marsha and his friends Gloria Katz and Willard Hack to revise the fourth draft in the final pre-production script. Lucas needed some dramatic artwork to approve the movie in the eyes of the other Fox executives, and he hired conceptual artist Ralph McQuarrie to create paintings of certain scenes. When Lucas delivered his screenplay to the studio, he included several of McQuarrie's paintings. Suitably impressed, they approved a budget of over $8 million. American Graffiti's positive reception granted Lucas enough sway to renegotiate his deal with Alan Ladd Jr. 
However, Lucas didn't want more money, but requested the sequel the rights to the film, protecting Star Wars' unwritten segments and most of the merchandising profits. When casting the movie, Lucas didn't want to go for big names, but sought out actors that lacked long experience and could project intelligence and integrity. Fox were concerned and demanded he cast some established actors to help sell the movie. Mark Hamill plays Luke Skywalker, a young man raised by his aunt and uncle on Tatooine. He dreams of adventure and fighting the Empire. Mark Hamill was awarded the role after providing a natural delivery to the dialogue, despite the space jargon heavy script and bringing a sincerity to the unfamiliar terms. Harrison Ford plays Han Solo, a distrustful and sarcastic smuggler on the run from debt. He is hired by Obi-Wan and Luke to take them to Alderaan in his ship, the Millennium Falcon. Initially, Lucas refused to audition Ford for the role due to his want for new faces and despite Ford previously working with Lucas on American Graffiti. Instead, Ford was brought in to assist in the auditions, reading lines with the other actors. As a result, he was also lumbered with explaining the concepts and context of the scenes they were reading. Lucas was eventually won over by Ford's betrayal and cast him instead of Kurt Russell. Kerry Fisher plays Princess Leia, a member of the Imperial Senate and leader of the Rebel Alliance. Numerous and various young actresses auditioned for the role of Princess Leia, but Fisher was the only one that conveyed an undeniable princess quality. Despite this, she was cast under the condition that she attend what she called a fat farm and lose £10 for the role. Alec Guinness is Obi-Wan or Ben Kenobi, an aging Jedi who fought during the Clone Wars. He takes Luke under his wing and introduces him to the Force. In order to satisfy the studio's desire for an established actor, Lucas cast Guinness to play this important guiding role. Guinness was one of the few cast members who believed that the film would be successful, and instead of a flat fee, he negotiated a royalties deal of 2% of the one-fifth gross pay to George Lucas, inevitably making him quite wealthy in later life. Despite his faith in the film, he only agreed to take part on the condition that he would not have to do any publicity to promote the film. After the trilogy had finished, Alec wanted to disassociate himself from the role due to the large amount of Star Wars fans contacting him. Anthony Daniels plays C-3PO, a protocol droid designed to serve human beings that apparently speaks over 6 million languages. Daniels said he wanted the role after seeing one of Ralph McQuarrie's drawings of the character and was struck by the vulnerability in the robot's face. Initially, Lucas had not intended to use Daniel's voice for C-3PO and instead auditioned nearly 30 well-established voice actors. However, according to Daniel's, one of these auditionees in fact recommended Daniel's own voice for the droid. Kenny Baker plays R2-D2, an astromech droid carrying Princess Leia's secret message for Obi-Wan Kenobi and the Death Star plans. Baker at 3 feet 8 inches tall was cast almost immediately after auditioning because Lucas said he was the smallest guy they had seen up until that point. Peter Mayhew plays Chewbacca, Han Solo's sidekick Wookiee and first mate of the Millennium Falcon. Standing at 7 feet 3 inches, Mayhew was cast as Chewbacca after he stood up to greet Lucas, before any real audition. He was in fact considered for both the role of Chewbacca and Darth Vader, but chose the former, desiring to play a hero. Peter Cushing, the star of many Hammer Horror movies, plays Grand Morf Tarkin, governor of the Imperial Outland regions and commander of the Death Star. Lucas had thought to cast Cushing as Obi-Wan, though deciding his lean features would best suit Grand Morf Tarkin. David Prowse, who also played supporting roles in Hammer Horror movies, and the following year would train Christopher Reeve to bulk up a Superman, plays Darth Vader. Similarly to Daniels, Lucas was reluctant to voice Vader in Prowse's own voice due to his English West Country accent and had initially intended the role for Orson Welles. However, after determining that Welles' voice was too recognisable, he instead cast a lesser known actor, James Earl Jones. Lucas continued to tweak the script during filming, including adding the death of Obi-Wan, suggested by his wife after realising he served no purpose in the ending of the film. Principal photography got off to a rocky start on March 22nd, 1976, in the Tunisian desert for the scenes on Tatooine, due to malfunctioning props and electronic breakdowns. Further disruptions were caused when a rare Tunisian rainstorm struck the country. Filming hoped to run more smoothly after moving to Elstree Studios near London, however strict British Union rules stipulated filming had to finish by 5.30pm, unless Lucas was in the middle of a scene. 
despite George's efforts, his crew failed to take the project seriously, considering it a children's film and finding it unintentionally humorous. Lucas often clashed with the director of photography, Gilbert Taylor, attempting to dictate where the lights should go on set and wanting to make adjustments himself, which Gilbert said wasn't his job. The DP would like the scene the way he thought George wanted it. Quickly, problems arose for Taylor describing the sets John Barry made as looking like a coal mine. He said that they were all black and grey, with really no opportunities for lighting at all. To resolve the problem, he worked the lighting into the sets by chopping holes in its walls, ceilings and floors, resulting in a cutout system of panel lighting. This solution allowed Lucas the freedom to shoot in almost any direction, without extensive relighting. Despite this, Gilbert was pretty much ignored in all the documentaries and only looked upon in a negative light. His contributions were never highlighted. He defined the look of Star Wars and should be complimented for his work. With Lucas being very shy and not being comfortable with large groups of people, he rarely spoke to the actors, who felt that he expected too much of them while providing little direction. His directions were usually limited to suggesting delivery by faster or more intense. This was about the only instruction he'd give anybody. During production, Lucas often appeared depressed despite the cast attempting to cheer him up. Eventually, the relentless demands of the project saw Lucas diagnosed with hypertension and exhaustion, and he was warned to reduce his stress levels. Post-production offered no respite due to increased pressure from 20th Century Fox, and reshoots were restricted after Mark Howell was involved in a car accident, leaving his face visibly scarred. 20th Century Fox executives eventually became sick of the movie, and the studio support was only offered from Alan Ladd Jr., who dealt with scrutiny from board members over the rising budget and complex screenplay drafts. After production fell behind schedule, Lucas was told to finish production within a week, or he would be forced to shut down. The crew split into three units, each being led by Lucas, Gary Kurtz the producer, and production supervisor Robert Watts. Under this new system, the project met the studio's deadline. Originally, Star Wars was destined for a Christmas release in 1976. However, due to the film's production delays, its release was pushed to the summer of 1977. Already under strict deadline pressure, Lucas was shocked when the original editor's cut was a complete disaster. He had to be replaced and Lucas hired Paul Hirsch and Richard Chu, also inviting his then wife, Marsha Lucas, to help the editing process while she was cutting New York, New York. Richard Chu criticised the original cut for having a lethargic pace, with the time being dictated by the actor's speed and for being edited in a by-the-book manner, with master shots flowing awkwardly into close-up coverage. Lucas needed a way of accelerating the storyline, and so removed Luke's early scenes and switched the early narrative focus onto C-3PO and R2-D2. This would also distinguish Star Wars from Lucas's earlier hit, like American Graffiti and avoid similarities with such teenage dramas. Sound designer Ben Burke created a library of sounds that Lucas referred to as an organic soundtrack. Blaster sounds were the modified recordings of a steel cable, under tension being struck. The lightsaber sound effect was a combination of the hum of idling interlock motors in aged movie projectors, and interference caused by a television set on a shieldless microphone. For Chewbacca's growls, Burt recorded and combined sounds made by dogs, bears, lions, tigers and walruses to create phrases and sentences. Ben Burt also created the robotic voice of R2-D2 by filtering his voice through a synthesizer. Darth Vader's breathing was achieved by breathing through the mask of a scuba regulator implanted with a microphone. In February 1977, Lucas screened an early cut of the film for Fox executives and several director friends. It lacked most of the special effects and the film often cut to footage of World War II dogfights. Lucas was disappointed by the reaction of the directors present, such as Brian De Palma, John Milius and Steven Spielberg. Spielberg seemed to be the only person in the audience to enjoy the film and believed that the lack of enthusiasm was due to the absence of finished special effects. However, Fox Studio executives loved the film. Gareth Wigan said it was the greatest film he'd ever seen and cried during the screening. Having struggled to gain studio approval for his previous movies such as THX 1138 and American Graffiti, especially the former, Lucas found the experience shocking and rewarding. Because of the positive reaction, Fox upped the budget from 8 to 11 million to allow Lucas to reshoot a number of scenes and get the special effects completed to meet its summer release date.
The film opens with a ginormous Star Destroyer chasing after a Rebel blockade runner. The galaxy is suffering under civil war, and the Rebels are escaping with hidden plans of the Empire's new Death Star. In the hope of finding an exploitable weakness, the leader of the Rebellion, Princess Leia, holds the plans, but her ship is invaded by Imperial forces under the command of Darth Vader. In an attempt to smuggle the plans off the ship before her capture, she hides the plans in the memory banks of R2-D2, along with a message of warning for the Jedi Obi-Wan Kenobi. The droid accompanied by C-3PO escape from the captured ship to the desert planet Tatooine. During their wanderings, the droids are captured by Jawa traders, who sell the pair to moisture farmers Owen and Beru Lars and their nephew Luke Skywalker. Whilst cleaning R2-D2, Luke accidentally triggers Leia's recording to Obi-Wan Kenobi, and Luke wonders if it's meant for old Ben Kenobi. Luke tells his aunt and uncle of what he has discovered. They tell him that Obi-Wan Kenobi has passed away, and to ignore the recording, but Luke thinks they are hiding something. Luke discovers R2-D2 has escaped to search for Obi-Wan. The next morning, Luke eventually finds R2-D2, and meets Ben after nearly being killed by attacking Tusken Raiders. Ben comes to the rescue and scares off the raiders, revealing himself to be Obi-Wan. Obi-Wan confines in Luke of his days as a Jedi, who were peacekeepers of the galaxy, with supernatural powers born from the Force. Luke learns he has been lied to by his uncle, that his father fought alongside Obi-Wan as a Jedi Knight in the Clone Wars, before he was apparently betrayed and murdered by Vader. Obi-Wan describes Vader as a former pupil, who turned to the dark side. Luke is offered his father's lightsaber by Obi-Wan. Obi-Wan listens to Leia's message in which she asks him to take the Death Star plans to her father on Alderaan, and Obi-Wan invites Luke to join him and learn the ways of the Force. In a moment of loyalty, Luke declines not wanting to let down his uncle, but after discovering the Stormtroopers have followed C-3PO and R2-D2 to Tatooine, and have destroyed his home and killed his aunt and uncle, he changes his mind. Obi-Wan and Luke travel to Mos Eisley, where Obi-Wan strikes a deal with smuggler Han Solo and his Wookiee Chewbacca to take them to Alderaan on the Millennium Falcon. The Empire has been alerted to the droid's presence and attempt to stop the Millennium Falcon from leaving. They escape and jump into light speed and head to Alderaan. When they finally arrive, they discover the planet has been destroyed. In the distance, they notice what appears to be a small moon. But it's not a moon, and is in fact the Death Star. They attempt to turn around, but they are trapped and pulled in by its tractor beam, and can't escape. The Academy Award winning effects were revolutionary for the time. Even the effects artists involved in the film would become celebrities themselves. John Dykstra, Richard Edlund, Dennis Murin, Joe Johnston and Phil Tippett all became recognised for their valuable efforts. George Lucas set up a new company called Industrial Light and Magic, as the film studios had pretty much closed down their FX departments due to the changes in the industry and many feature films not requiring extensive optical and visual effects. ILM was struggling from the beginning to achieve the large amount of effects needed for the film. While George was shooting in the UK, the company had already spent half of its budget on just four shots that Lucas had still deemed unacceptable. Rumours suggested ILM workers lacked discipline, with many having a hippie-like attitude and working at a slow pace. Once shooting was finished in the UK, Lucas managed the group to ensure they were on schedule. With hundreds of uncompleted shots remaining, ILM was forced to finish a year's work in six months. To help speed up the process, Lucas inspired ILM by editing together aerial dogfights from old war films which enhanced the pacing of the scenes and gave the crew a good indication of how to set up the shots. The effects team made great use of motion control technology, which was a setup from existing techniques, but utilised computer technology to program how the camera moves. This basically gave you the option to make precise camera moves and allow you to reset shots if needed without any errors. You could zoom towards the models and do elaborate camera moves without having to move the models in some cases. You could incorporate movement from both the models and the camera to provide exciting and dynamic shots. The film includes fantastic matte paintings provided by Harrison Ellenshaw, and people were blown away upon seeing the lightsaber for the first time. At that point, every kid wanted one. The lightsabers were essentially wooden sticks with projection material wrapped over them, so when light is cast on them, they glow, and in post-production they would rotoscope the glowing colours over them. It's a time-consuming effect to rotoscope every frame, hence why they didn't use the lightsabers that much during the sequels. The 
The soundtrack to Star Wars was composed by John Williams. He was recommended to Lucas by his friend Steven Spielberg, whom he had worked with on the film Jaws and won an Academy Award. Lucas desired a score that would provide some emotional familiarity for the audience, considering the number of foreign environments they would be experiencing visually. Despite big orchestral scores no longer being very popular, Lucas wanted a grand musical sound for Star Wars and pushed for the classic methods of film composing. In March 1977, Williams conducted the London Symphony Orchestra to record the Star Wars soundtrack, for which it was his first time working with them. The original soundtrack was released as a double LP in 77. It sold extremely well and is still one of the most popular film soundtracks ever released. It's always hard to decide which soundtrack out of the original trilogy is the best. The scores for the sequels do have a little more finesse and sound cleaner, but the original is where all those classic themes were introduced and where they first grabbed our attention. There are key moments for me where the music really makes my hair stand on end and gets the emotional response it so deserves, such as when Luke looks to the suns as they set in the distance and when he sees the remains of his relatives and the death of Obi-Wan. John Williams brought these films to life. I believe without his music they would have never had the success they did. The presence of a good soundtrack is key to a movie and sadly I think that's a theory that many filmmakers tend to ignore today. There are so many bland and forgettable soundtracks out there from the past two decades that just seem like background noise. Obviously there are good scores that break out of the generic mould of modern cinema, but there seems to be less focus on providing an identity to a movie's soundtrack. You always know you're in safe hands with John Williams. The soundtrack is very easy to track down, it's been re-released countless times in many collector's editions. I'm sure it's already in most Star Wars and soundtrack collector's hands. You'd be a fool not to own it. One of the most fondly remembered arcade games was produced by Atari and released in 1983. The Star Wars arcade game is a first person space simulator replicating the attack on the Death Star. It is composed of 3D colour vector graphics and features several digitised samples of voices from the movie. The same game was converted to pretty much all computer systems during the late 80s, all of them vary in quality with the Amiga version coming out on top, but you can easily emulate it for your PC and Apple Mac. However, you can also get it as part of the bonus disc for Rogue Squadron 3 Rebel Strike on the GameCube. In Japan 1987, Namco produced a game based on the film for the Nintendo Famicom. It is the only game in the Star Wars franchise that was released exclusively in Japan. The game is a side-scrolling platformer where the player controls Luke Skywalker, but for some reason he has black hair, I think due to the graphical limitations. Luke mostly uses his lightsaber, but he can also use the force to achieve special moves like floating, speeding and stopping time. As you rescue characters, they aid you by providing hints to help you progress through the game. You also get the chance to pilot the Millennium Falcon as you fight TIE Fighters. The game is very difficult to play and very frustrating, as the player only has three lives and two continues, and Luke dies upon touching an enemy. Although appearing pretty faithful, the game's story does deviate from the film very often. For example with Darth Vader having apprentices that shapeshift to appear identical, and exploring planets that never appear in the film. A new version was developed by Beam Software that turned up in late 1991 for the NES and was also ported to the Game Boy, Sega Game Gear and Master System. The game is closer to the storyline of A New Hope than the 87 release. Here you play and pilot a land speeder around Tatooine, collecting R2-D2 from the sand crawler, finding Obi-Wan Kenobi in a cave and meeting Han Solo in the Mos Eisley bar, all the while fighting stormtroopers, sand people and many other enemies from the movie. Once the team is brought together, the player navigates the Millennium Falcon through an asteroid field to the Death Star, where you are required to destroy the tractor beam and generator, rescue Princess Leia, then destroy the Death Star with the Rebel fighters. The game was a huge improvement on the previous release and demonstrates some great graphics on the old 8-bit console. In 1992, Super Star Wars arrived on the Super Nintendo and was later re-released on the Virtual Console in 2009 and more recently on the PS3 and 4. It's basically the SNES equivalent of the Star Wars NES game. Super Star Wars is built of mostly run and gun gameplay, although it has other stages such as driving a land speeder or flying an X-Wing. You can also take your pick of multiple playable characters with different abilities. Super Star Wars generally follows the plot of the film, although certain adaptations are made to make a coherent action game. Now this game was super hard, no save options or passwords, but you could put a cheat in to jump to the next level. I tried to play this a number of times, but I always lost my temper with it. 
However, it does have fantastic graphics and is fun to play if you have the patience. Star Wars returned to the arcades in 1993, produced by Sega. It follows specific events from the trilogy, such as escaping and attacking TIE fighters in an asteroid field, destroying a Super Star Destroyer, and then the final assault run on the Death Star. You can control an X-Wing or a Y-Wing, and you can switch between an interior or exterior angles of your spaceship. With it being an arcade game, it wanted to eat up your spare change, so it was very difficult. It was ported to the Sega 32X and released as a launch title for the disastrous Sega Mega Drive add-on. The reviews were mixed on release, many liked the graphics though but found the difficulty curve too high and the gameplay way too repetitive. When it comes to reviewing Star Wars, it's always going to be difficult to add further to what has already been said by other critics over the past 30 years. It's a beloved movie that has inspired generations of filmmakers and made a huge impact on the industry, also changing the way merchandise can play a big part in a movie's success. For me, I want to draw upon my memories of the film and how it impacted me as a kid and how it still holds up today. Star Wars was not the first film of the series that I saw. I recall Return of the Jedi being the first to grab my attention with its premiere on UK television around 1988. At this point I was only around 5 years old. Star Wars toys were still being sold despite the trilogy having been finished and I was fascinated by the design of the world and the sense of adventure these films brought. Looking back during the late 80s and early 90s, Star Wars wasn't really popular anymore. Kids had moved on to Ninja Turtles which was dominating the toy shelves. All the kids who adored the series when they came out had grown up and sold their collections mostly at car boot sales. This is where my Star Wars obsession began to bubble. The toys were super cheap and I spent my pocket money collecting the toys and amassing a sizeable collection. Being a kid buying the movies on VHS was a costly option. You could either rent a worn out tape or head down to your local WH Smiths and fork out the high prices for the official tapes. 15 to 20 pound to a kid was a lot of money. Think of all the sweets or cinema trips you could afford with that back then. I always chose the first option because the Star Wars films were often on television and taping it was the cheapest way. When you are a kid you are not fussed about owning the official VHS tape, just as long as you have the film. Around 1995 Star Wars began to return to popularity. Lucasfilm and Fox re-released the films as part of a last chance to own campaign of the original trilogy because of George's plan to do the special editions. I was desperate to own these new widescreen THX tapes, but never managed to get them all, however I did get episode 4 for that Christmas. It was such a great opportunity to see it in widescreen and not a crappy pan and scan recording of TV. When you are a kid you are often just taken in by the visuals. The story obviously plays a part, but the action is what keeps you hooked and inspires you when it comes to playing with the toys or reenacting scenes with your friends. But when you get older the story is what keeps you returning and captures your emotions and sense of excitement. Star Wars is a simple tale of good versus evil. It draws upon classic themes of mythology and wraps it up in a new package with a great sci-fi twist. A traditional story of a hero who goes on a journey to save a princess from an evil empire. He is joined by a wise man and encounters friends along the way and with added extra comedic characters thrown in. Everything seemed familiar but felt new at the same time. The world they inhabit felt lived in. Everything seems rusty and broken down but also had incredible detail. Previously science fiction movies had this clean and sterile look to their design, often having wacky colour schemes, but this looked like a functioning world. Star Wars was always fantasy based, there are no attempts to strive to be realistic and be linked to pure science fiction. There is no explanation of how things work, things just happen at the flick of a switch and technology is taken for granted as if lived with for years. The power of the force itself could have come across as confusing, but with how the dialogue is scripted it made it easy to understand and grasp what the force was. Everything in the movie flows so smoothly with its use of threat, danger and emotions. When Obi-Wan and Luke see the Jar was attacked and killed by the Empire, it really gives you a strong sense that they can't be reasoned with and are a serious threat to the galaxy. Then when Luke returns home and sees the remains of his aunt and uncle, it's this powerful imagery that really drives the audience's hatred towards the Empire. It's one of those early moments where you see the anger in Luke's eyes. 
with Luke going on his adventure to help Obi-Wan, you are really behind him and wanting him to succeed. The movie really makes you feel like you are on the adventure as well. Even though George Lucas had planned sequels, it still was its own self-contained film. If it wasn't a success and the sequels weren't made, it would still stand proudly on its own. The story is open for sequels, but it's not its priority to set up a continuation. Many people involved in the production never considered there being a follow-up movie, probably due to their lack of confidence in it. So the key elements in this movie such as the Force, the Empire and knowing more about these characters are really what was expanded upon in the sequels. Thus people seem to enjoy those movies more. Star Wars is inherently more simple and gives you just enough information to keep you invested. Star Wars seems like a movie that could have failed if one key source was removed. What if it didn't have John Williams' epic score or have the jaw-dropping visual effects? Would it have made the impact it did or have been received by critics as well as it did? A good story is what makes a film special and this story is great. It contains the action, adventure, peril and is topped off with a slice of comedy. It bounces out all the ingredients audiences would want. You would have to be one serious grumpy bastard not to be entertained by Star Wars. But its story was given that extra boost by its production design, effects and music. It's a movie that was saved by editing. Every element was key to the movie's success. With George Lucas having a studio leaning over him and many people on the crew not being afraid to voice their opinions, it really helped the film evolve and improve during its production. If George Lucas got his own way, it may have been a mess from the start. The original trilogy has not been available in their true forms since the mid 90s. In 2006, you could get them as bonus discs transferred from the old Laserdisc Masters. However, these exhibit noise reduction that smears the picture and has signs of anti-aliasing. George Lucas has refused to release the original versions because they are apparently not what he intended and there's been no further official release of the classic versions we all grew up on. So the dedicated hardcore fans decided to take matters into their own hands and restore the films in HD to how they were originally conceived. They took footage and clips from many sources including 16 and 35mm prints, TV broadcasts, laser discs and the more current Blu-rays for scenes that didn't require adjustments. The CGI has all been removed and the colours have all been colour corrected to match the original 35mm negatives. Many talented individuals contributed to these new cuts, working many hours for free just out of love and to see the movies they grew up on in their original form. These fan edits are referred to as the despecialized versions. There are other fan cuts available but these are the ones I'm most familiar with. The new edits are not hard to track down online but make sure you own the Blu-ray releases before you make any attempts to download them. It's only fair. But these versions are absolutely fantastic and it's the only way to see them in their true original form. In its original theatrical form the film is by no means polished. Its low budget is very much apparent with wobbly sets, visual effects that were too ambitious for the time especially the land speeder with its obvious Vaseline smudged on the lens. The explosion of Alderaan and the Death Star never looked as epic as they should have been. The explosion of Krypton in Superman the movie shot a year later was more effective. With its current state the added CGI has improved some effects such as the opticals, map paintings, the land speeder, screen wipes and the exploding planets but Lucas went too far, abusing the technology throwing in scenes that didn't improve the movie but just made it look dated by today's standards. CGI dates far quicker than miniatures and opticals. Seeing Jabba and Mos Eisley today just seems so out of place. Don't get me started on Greedo shooting first. An unnecessary adjustment that makes it clear George didn't understand his own characters. In my opinion the Death Star attack seemed ideal to improve if I had to choose a sequence that needed further attention. Because of the short schedule many shots looked rushed, so with the modifications the sequence flows better. With just spaceships and the black background of space, they don't stick out like a CG character. I never had a problem or complaint about the updates added here. At the end of the day, if George Lucas gave us the option to choose if we wanted to watch the special editions or the originals, then the backlash and complaints would have been minimal. I do sympathise with Lucas in wanting to update these movies. They are his property. He can do what he wants with them, but not listening to his audience has given him unnecessary hate. Many films today have the option to select the theatrical cut or the extended cut etc, but Lucasfilm has been stubborn and denied us that choice, often given us weak excuses to explain why they haven't been released. Some reports claim the prints are in a bad condition, although I'm pretty sure they were remastered in 97 when they did the first special edition. 
maybe when the Blu-ray of Force Awakens is released, the fans will get to have the unaltered versions in HD. Star Wars is just as special today as when it was released. Despite the constant changes made to it over the years by George Lucas and the relentless tweaking to the visual effects, its qualities have not been diminished. It arrived at the right time to make the impact it did. Its influences on pop culture are still strongly felt today. It's the ultimate feel-good movie. The cast all do splendid jobs with their performances and by the end when Luke destroys the Death Star and him and Han Solo receive their medals, it just lifts your spirits. It's hard to get that strong emotion from audiences, but everyone involved delivered something truly special and the film has remained in people's hearts and minds since 1977 and it will do for decades to come. It's a timeless movie that will never be forgotten for its achievements and the impact it made on all of us. I hope that old man got the tractor beam out of commission or this is going to be a real short trip. Okay, hit it! Are they away? They'll just make the jump into hyperspace. You're sure the homing beacon is secure aboard their ship? They're taking an awful risk, Vader. This had better work. Not a bad bit of rescue, huh? You know, sometimes I amaze even myself. That doesn't sound too hard. They let us go. It's the only explanation for the ease of our escape. Easy? You call that easy? They're tracking us. Not this ship, sister. At least the information in R2 is still intact. What's so important? What's he carrying? The technical readouts of that battle station. I only hope that when the data is analyzed, a weakness can be found. The battle station is heavily shielded and carries a firepower greater than half the Starfleet. Its defenses are designed around a direct, large-scale assault. A small, one-man fighter should be able to penetrate the outer defense. So, you got your reward and you're just leaving then? That's right, yeah. Besides, attacking that battle station ain't my idea of courage. It's more like suicide. They're in position. I'm gonna cut across the axis and try and draw their fire. Spread five, I'm going in. We've picked up a new group of signals. Enemy fighters coming your way. Watch it, you've got one on the tail! Several fighters have broken off from the main group. Come with me. Fighters coming in. Point three. I'm in. I can't stay with you. Get clear, Wedge. You can't do any more good back there. Sorry. I'm on the leader. Use the force, Luke. The force is strong with this one. Rebel base in range. You may fire when ready. I have you now. What? Yeah! Look out! You're all clear, kid. Now let's blow this thing and go home. will be with you always if you enjoyed the video you can find more on my youtube channel and also you can follow me on twitter if you want to help support the channel you can donate through patreon and receive monthly perks such as updates on the latest news on my channel early access to reviews and commentaries before they go live on youtube even the smallest donation can help keep this channel going thank you